I'm Jeff Cohen with USAID Indonesia. Today, I'm here with Dr. Munral Shetty, Chief of Health at UNICEF Indonesia. Dr. Shetty is a medical doctor with more than 20 years of experience in public health around the globe. Thank you, Dr. Shetty, for joining me here today. We're here to talk about lead, and specifically, we're here to talk about the problem of lead poisoning. Lead is a metal that's found in many common household products, such as paint, cookware, cosmetics, and spices. We know that exposure to lead is very dangerous, especially for children, even if it's only in small amounts. Studies show that half the children in low and middle income countries are subject to lead poisoning. And lead poisoning doesn't just affect children, it also causes about 1.5 million people a year to lose their lives. That's why this month, USAID and UNICEF launched the Partnership for a Lead-Free Future, a new initiative that aims to end lead poisoning by 2040. I'm thrilled to announce that here in Indonesia, the Ministry of Health has joined this call to action. Through the Partnership for a Lead-Free Future, we are working with governments, the private sectors, and many others to reduce lead in consumer products and the environment. Dr. Shete, I know lead exposure is an important issue for UNICEF. Thank you for joining me today to talk about lead and why it's so dangerous. My first question, and we'll get to a few questions today, is what is lead and why is it so important to address the problem of lead poisoning? Thank you, Jeff, uh, for having me today. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here speaking to you on this very, very important topic in this very, very moment in time. Uh, we are here to talk today about lead, uh, the villain lead, right? But let me give you a few facts about lead. Uh, discovered around 6,000 years ago, first used by Egyptians, they used it for small sculptures and pottery. Uh, the Greeks thereafter figured out that if you line things with lead, uh, things don't corrode, mm -hmm. and therefore used it in the shipping industry. And in some places, the practice continues even today. The Chinese used leads in two, uh, lead in 2000 BC and forged their coins. And the Romans, uh, who were probably the smartest of them all, developed entire water systems and pipelines and drainage systems based on lead. So it was widely used across <laughs> history. Across. And that's why I'm saying it historically was looked at as a very, very useful element. Over the last few years, uh, more and more increasingly, the toxic effects of lead have come out in the open. Many countries have banned its use, but even today in some countries it's an in ingredient in gasoline, it's still used in cosmetics, you mentioned spices, there are traditional medicines, and uh, through industrial emissions in, and paints, lead continues to contaminate an environment, either leaching into the soil, entering water sources, or moving around through airborne as lead dust. The second part of your question was why is it dangerous? So for that you need to understand what lead actually does. Lead gets absorbed either through ingestion, inhalation or through contact and depending on the dose that it is in, uh, ingested in or inhaled in or uh, absorbed in, uh, you start having impact in the short term and long term on the neurological systems. Right? Now children, their neurological systems are nascent developing and not yet fully formed as in adults and therefore they are four to five times more vulnerable to the side effects of lead poisoning than anyone else. So what actually happens? Number one, you have challenges in cognitive development. Your brain uh, development ceases, uh, your IQ decreases and there is another interesting data point that says that 20% of the gap in learning outcomes between rich and poor countries can actually be uh, attributed to lead poisoning. Wow. So one thing is causing all of this inability for children to learn uh, the same way in developing countries and lesser developed countries. Wow. Uh, further, it has underlying health problems like uh, chronic exposure will lead to anemia, it will cause kidney damage, you will get high blood pressure. If a pregnant woman uh, is exposed to high levels of lead, she risks miscarriage, stillbirths and premature delivery. There is good data showing that over 800 million children worldwide have 
blood lead levels of more than 5 microgram per deciliter which is like a trigger of this is not good 800 million 800 million worldwide <sighs> yeah Uh, 4.6% of all the burden of the cardiovascular diseases and 3.1% uh, of the global burden of chronic kidney diseases can all be attributed to the impact of lead. I'm water. starting to understand exactly why you call lead a villain. It's not just one thing that it's causing but a whole series of problems in human development especially in children. Yeah. This guy's dad as a friend, it really does have serious toxic potential. I mean impact and that's why it's a big health issue but all of this is best understood if you understand the economic impact of this mm -hmm. and it is estimated that it uh, the lead accounts for a, a loss of an estimated 1.4 trillion US dollars to the global economy each year clearly this is a serious problem that needs to be addressed i'm glad that this partnership has been launched to do so Can you explain in the modern world and specifically here in Indonesia and other places that you've been what types of products still contain lead that need to be uh, you know the, the regulations and the production of these products needs to change? Uh, thank you for that question again. Uh, lead as is in the environment uh, in its net natural form is quite safe, right? E everything starts when you start extracting it. So when you're doing mining, you're doing smelting to try extract the active lead ingredient. That's when the problem starts because during this process, you start throwing up vapors of lead in the air, you start leakages into the soil and you start contaminating the water. And that's when due to human activity, lead starts percolating into the system. Uh, so mining, smelting, lead acid batteries, paints the lovely colorful paints that all you see can owe their you know glaziness to lead right uh, so a children's toy that's bright and shiny and attractive to look at could contain, could contain lead. lead unless you're very very careful uh, lead has been found in cosmetics it has been found in traditional medicines uh, it has been found in pieces of jewelry right It's interesting. So lead is used to make things prettier, to make things brighter, but it comes with a really troubling cost. Troubling cost. Uh, the big, big, big elephant on this are the lead acid batteries, especially the ones you use in motorcycles and cars. And at the end of life, these need to be recycled. So recycling of used lead acid batteries is a huge, huge challenge especially if the recycling is done in the unorganized sector where there are strict, uh, less stricter norms and uh, no oversight on the implementation of standard guidelines. So there needs to be norms on production of any product that may or may have lead, a reduction in certain products that are more dangerous if they have lead, and, and now I'm understanding recycling of lead acid batteries needs control, it needs to be formalized, and it needs to be done so in a way that protects those doing the recycling as well as those that live around Absolutely. the batteries. So tell me a little bit about what UNICEF, uh, the organization where you work in Indonesia, is helping to reduce lead pollution, prevent lead poisoning and what can we as citizens living in, in, in the world where lead is still active, how can we pr better protect our families from potential lead poisoning issues? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, about four and a half, five years ago, UNICEF embarked on this uh, lead prevention journey, very focused on Indonesia along with a few other countries. Uh, during this journey, we invested a lot of time trying to understand what are the sources of lead poisoning. Once you got a get better idea of that, we worked with other global partners to identify sites which are contaminated. So there was a whole body of work which involved sample testing, blood lead level testing in children and other people who had exposure to lead. Gathering all of this data, there was a quite a decent sense on how big the problem was. We continue to gather some of the data uh, in terms of trying to do research among children uh, of various age groups and trying to see how lead in Indonesia is impacting behaviors in these children. So you're still learning the, the negative impacts of lead poisoning here in Indonesia. And what are you so finding? Especially focusing on this. So it's early stages yet, but enough to tell you that uh, in the small samples that have been tested, 
blood lead levels are significantly high. There's Above that, five, five microgram per deciliter. In fact, some of the sites are astonishingly high and alarmingly high. Oh, wow. So as this data comes in and we start realizing this, we start mobilizing what to do about it, right? So we try and create awareness. We work with school children, with teachers and the health system trying to create an awareness that lead poisoning is a problem. And these are the signs and symptoms that you should be looking for uh, if you want to you know, work towards early identification of lead poisoning. So first data to understand the problem and then awareness to identify that this is a problem and here are the, the areas of concern. Uh, do you work in coordination with the government of Indonesia on this? So we work with the Ministry of uh, Health specifically as well as its divisions which look on environmental health. We also work with the Ministry of Environment on this one and uh, as we step further we have already started our work with the Ministry of Industry because mm -hmm. of the impact of the lead that is in, in, in the paint, you know, the lead and paint story. So as we first uh, sort of create an awareness we also need to under, uh, make sure that those who are going to provide the services if you have a problem are also mm -hmm. now trained. So we have had a lot of training programs right from healthcare workers at the front line to medical doctors to understand signs and symptoms of lead and how do you treat lead. And in fact we have spent quite a bit of time developing the national guidelines for treatment uh, supporting the Ministry of Health in this venture. So what usually will happen is that once the lead lead levels are high you need to start treatment, right? And treatment is done by specific chelating agents. Right. Now, one other challenge UNICEF had was the availability of chelating agents. It's not part or easily available in the essential drug list of the country. Okay. So working with the FTA of Indonesia, working with the ministry and the insurance agency, BPJS, we have all committed kind of come together to um, get all of this into the system and also make sure that testing becomes a norm because uh, there is, you can't walk in somewhere and say, test me for lead. Yeah. Uh, just last question, and what can we do to make sure that we're protected from potential lead poisonings in, uh, from our families and our communities? Uh, I think there are uh, several steps that we as organizations can do, and then some of that support can also be garnered from the community themselves, right? So this is an ongoing journey. Uh, for example, there are some easy and quick wins if we work as teams together and that is the lead in the paint. Uh, the industry currently has standards which were recently revised to decrease the level of lead in the paint. But those standards are voluntary, not yet mandatory. But so we need mandatory standards for reducing lead in paint. Can we just eliminate lead and paint? Is that a step too far or is that a step that is the ultimate goal? So we are actually also working with partners whose specialization is to substitute lead in paint. Okay. And when we get them on board and get the industry aligned to that thought process, uh, there will be gradual shift. Of course, it's business, so costs are involved. So making massive switches on key ingredients is not a cakewalk. And there needs to be a lot of buy-in and, and you know collaboration happening across multiple agencies. As I mentioned, used lead acid batteries is creating havoc in some regencies, especially in Tegal and Bogor. So UNICEF worked with the local province government as well as all its allied agencies and worked on making sure that those contaminated sites now had a remediation plan in place, uh, worked with the healthcare workers to identify uh, children who are uh, you know, um, showing signs and symptoms of lead poisoning work with communities on making aware that hey your kids cannot be playing in these dump sites and these are the signs and symptoms and you need to bring them back and then of course enabling an environment for testing and treatment so these are like small pilot examples that can be taken up in other places where the incidence of uh, lead poisoning is very high and quickly adapted as these are local Indonesian models. So they're more fit for context than something that would have brought from outside. Uh, it sounds like UNICEF has, has started uh, with a great program focused on the areas of biggest concern. Uh, and I thank you for that leadership uh, in this, in tackling what is uh, an in, a difficult villain to, to address. But I think now that uh, there's a partnership around this globally, uh, more work can be done to, to solve this problem. Uh, I want to say thank you to Dr. Shete for helping us understand the dangers of lead poisoning and how to prevent it. 
Uh, lead is a poison, and no amount is safe. That's why USAID, UNICEF, and here in Indonesia, the Ministry of Health and partners around the world are working together to advocate for a lead-free future for all children. Let's give children a healthy start in life. Lead poisoning is preventable, but all of us need to take action to solve it. I invite all of you to join us in the fight to help end lead poisoning by 2040. Together, we can make a difference. Uh, thank you so much. Terima kasih, Tanya. Terima kasih.